This is the first video in a series on the female reproductive system. The female reproductive system is made up of internal and external sex organs. It is immature at birth and develops to maturity at puberty to be able to produce gametes and also to carry the fetus to full term. The internal sex organs are the uterus, the fallopian tubes, and the ovaries. The uterus, which is popularly known as the womb, accommodates the embryo, which develops into the fetus. The uterus also produces vaginal and uterine secretions, which help the transit of sperm to the fallopian tubes. The ovaries produce the ova, also known as the eggs. The external sex organs are also known as these genitals, and these are the organs of the vulva, which include the labia, the clitoris and the vaginal opening. The vagina is connected to the uterus at the cervix. The uterus and the uterine tubes are covered by the fold of the broad ligament. The uterine tubes are lateral extensions of the uterus. They are suspended in the part of the broad ligament known as the mesosalpinx. The tubes are lined with nutrient-loaded ciliated columnar epithelium supported by connective tissue and smooth muscle. The rhythmic contractions of this muscle aids the movement of ovum or egg from the fimbri to the uterine cavity, whereas the lining cells support it nutritionally. The fallopian tube is about 4 inches long and has three rather distinct parts. These are the distal portion, which is known as the fimbri. Now the fimbri are finger-like projections which catch the discharged ovum and propel it into the tubular lumen. Next is the ampulla, which is the widest part of the tube. The third part of the fallopian tube is the isthmus. The lumen of the isthmus narrows as it enters the uterine cavity. The uterus is a pear-shaped structure about three inches long. It gets bigger in pregnancy. The upper part which is located above the tubal openings is called the fundus. The central part is the body or the corpus and the lower portion is called the cervix. The uterus is usually antiverted and antiflexed, meaning that it is tilted and bent forward relative to the vagina. Its neck or the cervix fits into the upper part of the vagina at about a right angle and the uterine body or the fundus is bent and tilted anteriorly over the bladder. Backward bending or retroflexion of the uterus can be seen in women who have given birth. A retroflexed uterus is predisposed to mild slipping into the vagina, usually referred to as prolapse of the uterus into the vagina. This is due to the fact that a retroflexed uterus is more in the axis of the cervix and vagina. Such a happening is generally resisted by the pelvic and urogenital diaphragms, the perineal body, and numerous fibrous ligaments such as broad ligament and condensations of the pelvic fascia that move the uterus and its tubes to the pelvic wall and the sacrum. The wall of the uterus is largely smooth muscle or myometrium. It is lined with a glandular surface layer of variable thickness known as the endometrium, which is extremely sensitive to hormones such as estrogen and progesterone. The cervix of the uterus, which is about one inch in length, has two parts. These are the superior supravaginal part and the lower vaginal part. The mucosal lining of the cervix is characterized by intersecting ridges that resist bacterial invasion after menses. The cervical mucosa does not participate in the periodic thickenings and thinnings experienced by the uterine body's mucosa. 
The vagina is an elastic fibromuscular tube with a mucosa lining of stratified squamous epithelium. The anterior and posterior mucosal surfaces are normally in contact. The anterior vaginal wall incorporates the short 4 cm urethra. The mucosa of the vagina has no glands. Therefore, secretory activity during sexual stimulation is derived from a transudate of plasma from the local capillaries and glands in the cervix as well as secretions from the male bulbo urethral glands. The vaginal lining reveals few sensory receptors. Now the cervix fits into the vagina and this creates a circular space on either side of the cervix which is known as the fornix. The posterior fornix is fibroblastic and is capable of significant expansion during intercourse. A central canal, which is known as the cervical canal, runs along its length and connects the cavity of the body of the uterus with the lumen of the vagina. The opening at the uterine end of the canal is called the internal os, whereas the opening at the vaginal end of the canal is called the external os. The uterus is supplied by the uterine artery and drained by the uterine vein. The ovaries are whitish in color and located alongside the lateral wall of the uterus in a region called the ovarian fossa. The ovaries are connected to either sides of the uterus by a fibrous cord known as the ovarian ligament. The ovaries are connected to the body walls by the suspensory ligament of the ovaries which is a posterior extension of the broad ligament of the uterus. That part of the broad ligament of the uterus that covers the ovary is known as the mesoverium. The ovary is thus considered an intraperitoneal organ. The ovaries are supplied by the ovarian arteries and drained by the ovarian veins. The round ligament of the uterus originates at the uterine horns in the parametrium. It maintains the anteversion or bending forward position of the uterus, especially during pregnancy. It is supplied by the artery of the round ligament, which is also known as the Samson's artery. The primary organ of the female reproductive system is the ovary, which produces the female germ cells or the ova and secretes the hormones estrogen and progesterone. Each ovary arises on the posterior abdominal wall in the lumbar region during early fetal development. During embryological development, the ovary is interrupted early in its downward journey by the round ligament and is retained in the true pelvis. The uterus serves as a site for implantation and nourishment of the developing embryo or the fetus. The cervical portion of the uterus sits into the vagina and forms a fornix on either side of the lower cervix. The uterine tubes or the fallopian tubes provide a conduit or a passage for the newly fertilized or unfertilized ovum on its way into the uterus. The uterine end of the fallopian tube can also be an implant site for a confused fertilized ovum that implants there. This causes an ectopic pregnancy which is potentially a life-threatening event. The vagina is a fibromuscular sheet. It receives the penis in sexual intercourse, provides a path for semen to reach the uterus via the cervix and also acts as a bed canal for the newborn. The ovaries are connected to the uterus by the ovarian ligament. The ovaries are also connected to the walls of the body by the suspensory ligament of the ovary, which forms the posterior part of the broad ligament. Between the uterus and the rectum, we can find the rectouterine pouch which is enclosed by parietal peritoneum. 
the round ligament of the uterus holds the uterus in an anti-flexed and an antiverted position where the uterus is bent forward at an angle over the urinary bladder. Between the urinary bladder and the uterus, we can find the vesical uterine pouch, which is also enclosed by parietal peritoneum. The pubic symphysis of the pubic bones are located anterior and superior to the urinary bladder. They are held in place by the pubic ligaments. The external genitals are located in the superficial perineum. The labia majora are fat-filled folds of skin that arise anteriorly from the anterior commissure of the vulva. They do not merge posteriorly and therefore become part of the skin over the perineal body. Medial to the labia majora and on either side of the vagina and urethra are two thin non-fatty folds of skin known as the labia minora. The space or cavity between the labia minora is the vestibule into which the vagina and the urethra open. These smaller labia can be followed anteriorly to the glands and body of the clitoris. Folds of the labia minora pass over the head and body of the clitoris forming the prepuces and the frenulum. Unlike the labia majora, the labia minora merge posteriorly over the perineal body. This fusion is indistinct after sexual activity begins. The clitoris has an erectile cruise which arises from each ischiopubic ramus. The true crura then join in the midline to form the erectile body or the corpus of the clitoris. This body is enclosed in fascia and capped by a skin-covered vascular sensitive glands clitoris. The rigidity of the clitoris is accomplished by the same mechanism operative in the penis. However, the clitoris, unlike the penis, does not incorporate the urethra. The erectile bulbs of the vestibule are separated into two bodies. They are covered by the bulbous spongiosus muscle and protrude into the vagina during sexual stimulation. The immature vaginal orifice is often closed or partly so by a thin mucosal membrane known as the hymen. The mature vaginal orifice is often surrounded by a thin remnant of this mucosa that was often torn with general physical or sexual activity. The ovaries are the primary organs of the female reproductive system. They are connected to the left and the right side of the uterus by the ovarian ligament. In an average woman, each ovary is about 3 cm long and 1.5 cm wide or smaller. Anatomically, the ovaries are located on the side of the true pelvis and attached to the posterior layer of the double fold of parieta peritoneum known as the broad ligament. Now the broad ligament is spread over the ovaries, the uterine tubes and the uterus like a blanket. Between the ovary and the opening of the uterine tube, which is known as the fimbria, is a space continuous with the peritoneal cavity. Upon expulsion from the ovary, the ovum must avoid this particular space, otherwise it will miss being picked up by the fimbria and into the uterine tube, which is an opportunity of a lifetime. The tonica albuginea is a layer of condensed tissue on the surface of the ovary. It is composed of short connective tissue fibers with fusiform cells between them. Primordial ova migrate from the embryonic yolk sac into the ovarian stroma and proliferate. Hundreds of thousands of these develop, but only a few hundred ever reach maturity. The two primary activities of the ovary are development of female germ cells, also known as ova, in the follicular phase 
as well as secretion of estrogen and progesterone in the luteal or secretory phase. The ovary reveals many follicles in various stages of development in the cushion of cells and loose connective tissue known as ovarian stroma. An ovarian follicle consists of an immature epithelial germ cell, also known as an oocyte. Now the oocyte is surrounded by one or more layers of non-germinating support cells. Development of an ovum starts with the primordial follicle, which is an oocyte with one layer of follicular cells. The oocyte increases in size and maturity as the follicle cells increase in number around it, forming a primary follicle. In secondary follicles, a small cavity known as the antrum appears. Now the antrum is filled with follicular fluid, so it continues to expand at the expense of follicle cells which are pushed away from the oocyte except for the single layer of cells known as the mature or graphene follicle. Those cells secrete estrogen during the follicular or proliferation phase of the reproductive cycle. Follicles that cease to develop at any stage are said to be atretic. By the 14th day of the ovarian cycle, a glycoprotein coat known as the zona pellucida surrounds the ovum of the mature follicle fully prepared for ovulation. A corona radiata of cells and the zona pellucida lined ovum bursts from the follicle into the waiting fingers or fimbria of the uterine tube. Now that the oocyte has been discharged, the ruptured follicle involutes, which means that the membranes close up. Some bleeding and clotting goes on, forming a corpus hemorrhagicum. Now the follicle cells transition into a corpus luteum, which is characterized by accumulation of large amounts of lipid, which is necessary for subsequent secretion of steroid hormones. The corpus luteum secretes estrogen and progesterone during this luteal phase of the ovarian cycle. In the event of a pregnancy, it will support the developing embryo or fetus for up to three months with these secretions. However, if fertilization does not occur, the corpus luteum will degenerate into a scar formation of itself known as the corpus albicans. The part of the blood ligament which is spread over the ovary is called the mesovarium, and the part which is spread over the uterine tube is called the mesosalpinx, where salpinx is referring to the uterine tubes. The ovary is supplied by the ovarian artery and drained by the ovarian vein. The suspensory ligament of the ovary is also called the infundibulopelvic ligament. It is a fold of peritoneum that extends out from the ovary to the walls of the pelvis. Now let's summarize the ovarian cycle using this diagram. So the development of an ovum starts with a primordial follicle, which is an oocyte with one layer of follicular cells. The oocyte increases in size and maturity as the follicle cells increases in number around it, forming a primary follicle. In secondary follicles, a small cavity known as the antrum appears. The antrum is filled with follicular fluid. So the antrum continues to expand at the expense of the follicle cells, which are pushed away from the oocyte except for the single layer of cells known as the mature or the graphene follicle. Those cells secrete estrogen during follicular or proliferation phase of the reproductive cycle. An atretic follicle is a follicle that ceases to develop at any stage of the cycle. By the 14th day of the ovarian cycle, a glycoprotein coat known as the zona pellucida surrounds the ovum of the mature follicle fully prepared for ovulation. 
a coronal radiator of cells and the zona pellucida lined ovum burst from the follicle into the waiting fingers or the fimbria of the uterine tube. Now that the oocyte has been discharged, the ruptured follicle involutes and this means that the membranes closes up. Some bleeding occurs and clotting also occurs which leads to the formation of corpus hemorrhagicum. Now the follicle cells transition into a corpus luteum which is characterized by accumulation of large amount of lipids which is necessary for subsequent secretion of steroid hormones. The corpus luteum secretes estrogen and progesterone during the luteal phase of the ovarian cycle. In the event of a pregnancy, it will support the developing embryo for up to three months with these secretions. However, if fertilization does not occur, the corpus luteum will degenerate into a scar formation of itself, which is known as a corpus albicans. Female germ cells proliferate by mitosis in the ovaries to form a large number of ugonia. These cells are diploid, containing two X sex chromosomes. They develop into haploid mature oocytes via the process of oogenesis. Now, this process is similar to spermatogenesis, however, there are some significant differences. The ovaries are a pair of organs that produce oocytes and reproductive hormones. They lie near the openings of the uterine tubes, also known as the fallopian tubes or the oviducts, that extend from the uterus. Finger-like projections from the uterine tubes, called the fimbri, collect oocytes when they are expelled from the ovaries. The oocyte is carried into the uterine tube for fertilization and subsequent implantation into the walls of the uterus. The adult ovary is predominantly made up of connective tissue that supports a large number of follicles. Blood vessels and nerves are concentrated within the central medulla, whereas follicles are found in the outer cortex in varying stages of development. Ugonia begin oogenesis by entering meiosis 1 in week 12 of embryonic development. During meiosis 1, the cell is known as the primary oocyte and it is surrounded by a thin layer of squamous epithelial cells. The primary oocyte at this stage is developmentally arrested in prophase of meiosis 1. The number of primordial follicles vastly increases during the fetal period, but many degenerate, leaving around 400,000 follicles available at puberty. No new oocytes are formed after birth. Now, with the onset of puberty, some of the primary oocytes continue oogenesis each month. The primary oocyte becomes larger and the follicular cells around it become cuboidal and the layer thickens. The follicle is now a primary follicle. The oocyte and the granulosa cells or the follicle cells produce a layer of glycoproteins on the surface of the oocyte called the zona pellucida. When a follicle forms more than one layer of granulosa cells, it is called the secondary follicle. One follicle continues to develop and grow and the others degenerate. A cavity called the antrum forms between the layers of the granulosa cells and a mass of follicular cells is now termed the cumulus orthorus. The connective tissue cells of this ovary around the follicle respond to differentiation and form two new layers. These layers are the tica interna and the tica externa. 
the thicker interna has a hormonal role, whereas the thicker externa has a supportive role. This follicle is now a mature vesicular follicle, also known as a graphene follicle. The thicker and granulosa cells of the developing follicles produce estrogens that cause the thickening of the endometrial lining of the uterus as well as other preparations necessary for receiving a fertilized oocyte. This occurs from days 5 to 14 of the menstrual cycle. The primary oocyte of the graphene follicle responds to surges in follicle stimulating hormone or FSH and luteinizing hormone or LH which is produced by the pituitary gland on days 13 and 14 of the menstrual cycle by resuming meiosis 1 and continuing cell division. Now when the oocyte divides it forms one large cell and one smaller remnant of the division known as a polar body. At the end of meiosis 1 the oocyte has become a secondary oocyte. Polar bodies are small, non-functional cells. They receive very little of the available cytoplasm and they degenerate soon after division. So the oocyte is able to retain its size but discard chromosomal material to become a haploid cell ready for fertilization. One polar body is formed with meiosis 1 and two polar bodies are formed with meiosis 2. The secondary oocyte begins meiosis 2 but this division is again halted. This time it occurs at metaphase 2. Meiosis 2 will only continue if the oocyte is fertilized. With ovulation, the secondary oocyte is passed into the uterine tube but the follicle remains within the ovary. At this stage, the follicle is very large and makes up a significant portion of the ovary. This follicle becomes the corpus luteum. In response to luteinizing hormone, the corpus luteum produces progesterone and estrogens and other hormones causing the endometrium of the uterus to thicken further and develop its vasculature, form glands, as well as prepare for implantation. If fertilization does not occur, the corpus luteum degenerates about 14 days later and becomes a scar tissue remnant of itself called the corpus albicans. Hormone production ceases and menstruation begins as the thickened endometrium is shed. The primary oocyte may be arrested in meiosis 1 throughout life for about 40 to 50 years if it is not triggered to continue development until a menstrual cycle late in reproductive life. DNA fragmentation within those stored oocytes is more common in older women as DNA damage increases with time. This may be the reason for reduced fertility with increasing age. Now, knowledge of the effects of sex hormones on follicle development have allowed invention of the oral contraceptive pill. High levels of estrogens and progesterone inhibit gonadotrophin releasing hormone and subsequently luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. Decreased levels of follicle stimulating hormone means that the follicle is not stimulated to develop and the absence of luteinizing hormone surge prevents ovulation from occurring. Chemotherapy and radiotherapy can destroy primordial ovarian follicles. There is a finite reserve of oocytes formed prenatally which cannot be replenished after treatment with chemotherapy. Therefore, the preservation of oocytes before treatment begins should be considered. Frozen oocytes may be used for in vitro fertilization at a later date if the patient becomes 
infertile. The menstrual cycle is a 28-day female reproductive cycle which is initiated and maintained by hormones. It involves significant alterations in the follicular and endometrial structure. The follicles develop in the ovary during the ovarian cycle. The endometrium is the inner lining of the uterus that undergoes growth and shedding under the influence of hormones. The menstrual cycle usually begins in young females of about 12 years of age and this is called menarche. The cycle usually ends in older women of about 45 years of age and this is called menopause. The monthly menstrual cycle is characterized by periods of endometrial breakdown and discharge popularly known as menstruation. During each cycle, the progressive changes that occur in the ovary and uterus serve to develop and release the female germ cell or the ovum for possible fertilization by the male germ cell and to prepare the endometrium for implantation of the fertilized ovum. Menstruation or the bleeding period usually constitutes the first four or five days of the cycle with loss of endometrial tissue and attendant bleeding. Endometrial growth on average begins on about the fifth day of the menstrual cycle. This growth is precipitated by hormones from the ovarian follicles which are regulated by hormones from the anterior pituitary gland. These are the follicle stimulating hormone or the FSH and the luteinizing hormone or the LH. During the last few days of the previous cycle and the first several days of the next cycle, these hormones, that is the FSH and LH, together with the estrogen, drive uterine development and stimulate follicular development. Follicular development starts to produce estrogen on about the seventh day. So we can see the increase in estrogen levels as well as its influence on the endometrial growth. On about the 14th day, the spike in the luteinizing hormone levels in the blood in conjunction with the rising titers of follicle stimulating hormone and estrogen brings on ovulation. This leads to rupture of the mature ovarian follicle or the graphene follicle and the release of immature ovum into the fimbria of the uterine tube. Following ovulation, the ruptured follicle undergoes significant reconstruction to form the corpus luteum. This is influenced by luteinizing hormone. On about the 21st day, the corpus luteum secretes progesterone and estrogen to enhance the endometrial gland development. The fibrous tumor soon becomes edematous with secretions, meaning that it becomes filled with secretions from the pits of the endometrial glands. Spiral arteries are physically forced to take tortuous turns around the many proliferating glands. If fertilization occurs on or about the 16th day, the corpus luteum becomes the principal source of hormones for the next 90 days. In the absence of fertilization, the corpus luteum begins to involute and degenerate to form a corpus albicans around the 26th day and estrogen with progesterone levels drop. In the absence of hormonal stimulation, the endometrium experiences reduced glandular secretions while the fluid absorption by the local veins continues unabated. In a short time, the tissues collapse like a delicate cake. The spiral arteries are flexed by these events and they then rupture and hemorrhage with considerable hydraulic force thereby disrupting the epithelial lining, the glands, and the fibrous tissues. With the exception of its stratum basale, 
the structural integrity of the endometrium is essentially destroyed. Reflex vasoconstriction limits hemorrhage. Disrupted tissue made up of menstruum, glandular tissue, and secretions together with blood and one or more unfertilized ova gravitate toward the vagina. After three to five days of menstruation, only about one millimeter in height of the endometrium remains for regeneration. Within the next two weeks, it will regenerate 500% to a height of about 5 mm. At puberty, estrogen in conjunction with growth hormone enhances female breast development. Males do not develop pronounced or physiologically matured breasts because their bodies produce lower levels of estrogens and higher levels of androgens, namely testosterone, which suppress the effects of estrogens in developing breast tissue. In women, the breast overlay the pectoralis major muscle and usually extend from the level of the second rib to the level of the sixth rib in the front of the rib cage. The breasts cover much of the chest area and the chest walls. At the front of the chest, the breast tissue can extend from the clavicle or the collarbone to the middle of the sternum or the breastbone. At the sides of the chest, the breast tissue can extend into the axilla or the armpit and can reach as far to the back as the latissimus dorsi muscle, extending from the lower back to the humerus bone, which is the longest bone of the upper arm. As a mammary gland, the breast is composed of predominantly two types of tissue, that is, the adipose tissue and the glandular tissue, which affects the lactation functions of the breast. The superficial fascia is an area of fatty or adipose and fibrous tissue with associated nerves, blood, and lymphatic vessels. The fatty tissue is supported by extensions of the deep fascia and suspensory ligaments that function most prominently in a young, well-developed, post-pubescent female breast. Packed within the adipose tissue is a collection of branching ducts known as the lactiferous ducts. In the male and in the non-pregnant, non-lactating female breast, these ducts are undeveloped. Very few or absolutely no glands are associated with the ducts in those populations. At puberty, the increased secretion of estrogen from the ovaries and perhaps the adrenal glands in the female influences the enlargement of the nipple and the areola, as well as a generally marked increase in local fat proliferation. As a result, the breast enlarges to some degree though it is highly variable. In the early stages of pregnancy, the lactiferous duct system undergoes profound proliferation. Small inactive tubular and alveolar or tubular alveolar glands begin to form, which eventually open into the alveolar ducts. A lobule consists of a number of these ducts and glands. There are approximately 15 to 20 lobes, which consist of a number of lobules and an interconnecting interlobular ducts. The interlobular ducts converge to form as many as 20 lactiferous ducts. These ducts dilate to form lactiferous sinuses and then narrow again within the nipple. These sinuses function as milk reservoirs during lactation. The nipple consists of pigmented skin with some smooth muscle fibers set in fibrous tissue. Erection of the nipple may enhance flow of milk through the ducts. The circular areola is highly pigmented more than the surrounding skin. 
It contains sebaceous glands that may act as a skin lubricant during periods of nursing a baby. In the latter stages of pregnancy, the alveolar glands undergo maturation and begin to form breast milk. Milk production peaks after delivery of the newborn as a result of the action of several hormones influencing the gland cells. The movement of milk toward the ducts, which is called a letdown, and excretion of milk to the nipple is the result of neuroendocrine reflex mechanism initiated by the baby sucking on the nipple. The lymphatic vessels are an important part of the breast. They drain the fatty portion of the milk produced during lactation. They also transfer infected material as well as neoplastic or cancer cells from the breast to more distant parts. These arrows indicate the potential lymphatic avenues for metastasis or the spread of infection. The most common channel of spread is to the axillary lymph nodes followed by the apical nodes and the parasternal nodes which are located alongside the sternum. In the average adolescent or prepubescent female, the developing breast possesses mainly the lactiferous sinus and lactiferous ducts with minimal fat. As she develops into a postpubescent adult, there is substantial amount of superficial fascia or fat, followed by development of glandular lobes during pregnancy and the enlargement of these lobes at the late stages of pregnancy and after delivery. Thanks for watching. Please like this video and subscribe to the channel. More videos coming up. See you in the next one.